the clinical evaluation of a patient for hyperbaric oxygen. The ability to appropriately select and evaluate patients for hyperbaric oxygen is the cornerstone of this field of medicine. Performed purposefully and effectively, it assures a good chance of recovery with minimal risk of side effects. Performed inexpertly, it renders this complex and expensive modality useless and even harmful. So this is always about doing the right things in the right way. Selection and evaluation are interrelated processes. Selection actually usually depends on evaluation, but the selection process often starts long before the actual evaluation of the patient can be made. This is because selection usually starts at the point of referral, and that often occurs over the phone in the absence of the patient. We have a patient in Ward 9 with a diabetic foot who needs a blast of oxygen, is often how they came to me. Now many books and lectures offer piecemeal information on how patients can be selected in general for medical procedures, but this requires you then to integrate these somewhat disjointed facts. This can be hard for an inexperienced hyperbaric physician to do, so the approach that I follow in this presentation is heavy on principles and light on actual criteria because these might change and be unique in your particular facility. The criteria are distributed throughout the training program. Each indication has its own unique aspect and approach. But for the purpose of this lecture, I'm trying to bring it all together and show you, if you like, the art of selecting patients for hyperbaric oxygen. To start with, let's begin with how we think about selecting patients for hyperbaric oxygen, followed by the way we then evaluate them when they are in our clinic. The 10 things to consider when selecting patients for hyperbaric oxygen are the pathophysiology, the conventional therapy, the odds and risks, the indication, the therapeutic mechanism, when to start, when to stop, the knowledge and experience you may have or may have access to regarding treating the condition, whether it actually makes sense and whether you'll be reimbursed either through a funder or through a research program. When evaluating patients, there are also 10 things to consider. The need for further testing, the general health and nutritional assessment of the patient, the wound assessment if there is one, the risk assessment which includes what has been abbreviated into seven steps, the risks of barotrauma, the risk of oxygen toxicity, hypoglycemia, visual changes, anxieties and phobias, medication, and cardiorespiratory status. These principles are by no means exhaustive, but they provide a scaffolding for thinking and for dialogue which I trust will be helpful. Over the rest of the presentation I will be considering each of these in turn and thereby offer some guidelines on how to approach the selection and evaluation process. Now selecting patients for hyperbaric oxygen therapy involves a combination of mental steps designed to appropriately match a patient's disease and the pathophysiological processes to the therapeutic mechanisms of hyperbaric oxygen. In other words, we need to match the remedy with the disease, and this is a helpful paradigm when people approach you with wishful thinking or perhaps with conditions that may indeed have merit but don't fall into the classic scaffolding of indications for hyperbaric oxygen. Now, the selection and matching process is often done intuitively in our general practice, but somehow, for many of us, even those initially trained in hyperbaric oxygen, it remains a somewhat alien practice. And therefore, we need to think again about the process whereby we think generally, so that we can avoid making inappropriate decisions based on wishful thinking or the desperation of parents, patients, or caregivers. As said before, one is usually confronted with the decision-making process as a result of the actual referral of a patient or request for consultation. Right there and then, it's necessary to have a ready response, and the ten items that were previously listed for the selection purpose of a patient for HPO provide a useful way to guide a focused discussion, determine the expectations of all parties, to define the responsibilities in taking care of the patient, to start outlining the overall patient management plan, 
and therefore by posing these issues as questions either to yourself or to the person who's asking for the referral, one is better able to then appropriately integrate HBO in the overall context, because this is often where things go wrong. What is the pathophysiology? I pose this as the first question to ask, because that allows us to consider what is actually wrong with a patient. And with that I don't mean the ICD-9 or 10 code, but the underlying problem. Even for a generic term such as a diabetic foot, there may be a predominantly macrovascular or microvascular problem. Charcot deformity, gangrene, wet or dry, necrotizing infection and so on. So one should not be blinded by the label. Then one should ask, what does the problem involve? Acute or chronic hypoxia perhaps, or acute or chronic ischemia? Is there significant edema, infection, ischemia reperfusion, or microvascular inadequacy, neuropathy? All of these things, and any of these things if they are present, will influence hyperbaric oxygen success and indeed whether the therapy would be of value. This is a patient that was referred to me after reconstruction in an irradiated field and a breast implant had been provided as part of the reconstructive process. Now this patient came as irradiated tissue and reconstruction, but clearly here we are dealing with a compromised flap and whether or not the tissue had been irradiated, the cause of the ongoing problem is exacerbated by the underlying implant. In our discussion, it was made very clear that this would need to be removed in order to allow hyperbaric oxygen to possibly recover the tissue that had become compromised. It was done, and indeed, it was ultimately successful. What is the conventional therapy? Again, before blindly accepting a patient for hyperbaric oxygen, it's very important to determine what the conventional therapy is or should be for this particular patient. We've found, unfortunately, that surgeons sometimes abandon appropriate care and dump patients on the hyperbaric service. So only by insisting on understanding the overall plan of care for the patient, this trap can be avoided. The result of this question may result in either not accepting a patient or by sometimes educating the referring physician with a humble attitude on the role of hyperbaric oxygen and both of these are valuable outcomes. In many cases, conventional therapy will already be in progress, but be at risk, such as a reconstructive effort or infection that is spreading beyond recent surgical boundaries. Even then, it's helpful to define the scope of conventional care before introducing HBO into the equation. Questions like, when is the patient going to surgery next? Okay, let me see the patient before then, and perhaps we can have... PE tubes inserted in the ear at that time because it's sometimes difficult for the patient to equalize if they are receiving repetitive anesthesia. This sort of practical and synchronized approach to patient care and hyperbaric oxygen can be invaluable in ensuring the smooth transition between a surgical and the hyperbaric service. I truly cannot overemphasize the importance of determining upfront what the expectations of the treating physician and patient are. It really is time well spent to explain where HBO fits into the overall management plan. And in fact, once this is clearly established, it will allow you to orient the patient who often feels lost in the somewhat invisible decision-making process. This assures their trust and compliance as participants rather than as blind victims of the plan. Then they know that you understand what's going on and they don't feel so lost in the medical machinery. They realize that HBO is part of the continuity of care. In short, by performing a proper assessment of what conventional therapy is being considered for a patient, irrespective of whether or not HBO is added, one may often avoid some of the pitfalls of bad referrals, bad timing, and unrealistic expectations. This is an example of a patient who was referred by an orthopedic surgeon from another facility thereby disallowing the examination of the patient prior to being transferred by ambulance. It really set us up. The orthopedic surgeon calling on a Friday afternoon indicated that the patient had uh, received a below-the-knee amputation for a diabetic-related problem, 
that he was a little bit concerned about the wound margins and that he felt that it would be wise to provide the hyperbaric oxygen therapy as a means to secure the normal healing at the original amputation level. By the time the patient arrived and we examined her, it was obvious that there was underlying fat necrosis and in fact already demarcation. This was going to be a hopeless case in terms of salvaging the original amputation level. And the patient ultimately, in a combination of hyperbaric oxygen and revision of the amputation to an above the knee site due to peripheral vascular disease, ultimately did recover. But it indicates that a simple referral without the requirement of the various questions can land you with a patient that truly is not an indication for HBO or in fact may represent a completely different problem than you originally think you would be getting. What are the odds? In determining whether or not hyperbaric oxygen has a place in the management of a particular patient's medical problem, it's important to consider what the odds are of HBO being helpful or harmful. Previous experience or scientific evidence may assist in deciding whether or not hyperbaric therapy may be of value. Even then, if at all possible, HBO should never be used as a last-ditch procedure. By accepting patients with a terminal graft failure, inoperable refractory osteomyelitis, grossly delayed treatment of crush injuries, irreversibly failed replantation procedures, or severe diabetic foot infection where preservation of function is no longer possible or sensible, both HBO and those practicing it will be discredited as a result of the ultimate inevitable failure. It is ironic that, while it may be incredibly hard to convince people of the merits of HBO, they somehow find it easy to attribute any adverse event to its use. However, HBO does have some risk, and part of any benefit determination includes the specific evaluation of risk factors and relative contraindications. For instance, a patient with terminal cardiac failure who is no longer able to walk and yet is referred for HBO to heal a painless leg ulcer may in fact constitute an inappropriate risk-benefit situation. The HBO may precipitate a worsening of the cardiac failure. Here the consideration of odds does not relate to the chance of success, but rather the probability of adverse effects related to HBO. So my recommendation is, learn to say no graciously but firmly. I have found that medical colleagues often respect you more for the patients you refuse than the ones that you accept. It shows discretion, it shows that you do not believe that HBO is for everyone, and in fact that you, like them, are physicians. We can only do what we can do. Why is hyperbaric oxygen therapy indicated? There are three possible situations. Firstly, the patient may be referred for a recognized indication for which HBO is truly appropriate. An example might be a patient who suffered from refractory localized osteomyelitis, who has received previous surgery and appropriate antibiotic cover for six weeks, and is now suffering from a recurrence of the infection. As long as subsequent surgery is able to remove the sequestrum and all the infected tissue, and this is done under appropriate antibiotic cover, this would indeed seem like an appropriate referral. The second situation is where the indication itself may be an accepted one, but the specific presentation is disqualifying. For instance, it may be a patient with a small draining sinus, but with diffuse osteomyelitis throughout the medullary cavity. There is no surgical prospect for eliminating the infection, and the disability related to relatively controlling the draining sinus, which is small, by an extirpative amputation and rehabilitation with a prosthesis, also does not seem appropriate. So under these conditions, hyperbaric oxygen is not appropriate, even though the medical condition, which would be classified as refractory osteomyelitis, might be an accepted indication as such. The third situation is where a patient is referred for a condition that is not an established indication for hyperbaric oxygen therapy at all. Examples of these may include acute or chronic stroke, various childhood neurological conditions, multiple sclerosis, autoimmune diseases without a wound, and here the medical decision might seem relatively simple. No, 
However, the expectations of the referring physician and indeed the patient themselves may sometimes necessitate educating and redirecting their efforts so as not to result in disillusionment, a sense of conspiracy, or some reason that HBO is then pursued elsewhere, including their own backyard with a do-it-yourself facility. So it's appropriate to be tactful, to make the point without making an enemy. Sometimes amputation is the appropriate response. In some situations, preserving a limb may cost a life. Which mechanisms are involved? In simplistic terms, it's useful to think of hyperbaric oxygen in terms of five primary categories. Hyperoxygenation, vasoconstriction, new vascularization, a broad range of altered cellular and biochemical functions, and increased pressure and gas gradients. Having this explanation handy makes it easy to educate referring physicians and patients and also to keep a clear focus on the actual objectives. Depending on the mechanism or mechanisms involved, hyperbaric oxygen therapy may be applied in different ways at different times. Consideration of treatment pressures, interval between treatments and the total number of treatments would all be closely linked to the underlying mechanism. When to start? Hyperbaric oxygen therapy should always be an integral part of the overall patient management plan. In the absence of this, it may be provided haphazardly with an excessive number of treatments. In our particular environment of reimbursement, we are often severely limited in the number of treatments we can provide. The average number of treatments over the broad spectrum of UHMS indications in other countries ranges in the 20s. In our country, it's 11. Yet our clinical results are often very similar to those experienced in centres around the world. And the only way that we have been able to achieve this is through actually budgeting the available treatments and planning them for the greatest clinical impact. For instance, by providing hyperbaric oxygen therapy at length prior to surgical debridement for osteomyelitis will result in a significantly higher number of treatments before the disease process is resolved. So in our experience, we've found that it's better to work around the scheduled surgery dates than to arrange these during the course of a hyperbaric therapy regimen. Surgery can always be deferred if needed, but it keeps people focused on the plan. If you only have a limited number of treatments at your disposal, you have to plan them very carefully. This is a patient who was referred by an orthopedic surgeon after two other orthopedic surgeons had indicated that the diabetic foot problem required an amputation. We were only granted 20 hyperbaric treatments and the question was where, if at all, we would decide to use them. What happened after transcutaneous oximetry confirmed that this patient was a good candidate was that we started the hyperbaric treatment and then after granulation tissue had appeared around 15 treatments, we terminated the hyperbaric oxygen therapy at that point, indicated that a split thickness skin graft might be useful, and then followed up with the final five treatments, again stopping at 20 treatments to see whether the patient recovered. Indeed, that was the case. With three weeks of wound care, the patient healed and retained his limb at least over the 18 months that we followed up with him. If we had not done so, it would have been very easy to run into the 30s or even 40 treatments. When to stop? Both when accepting the initial referral as well as while discussing the management plan, it's important to identify the milestones and the endpoints. Will the wound be treated to a point of closure or only until sufficient granulation tissue has developed so that the patient is deemed to be host competent? What clinical markers will be used? Reduction in pain? improvements in the lab results, plateau in neurological improvement in the case of decompression illness. So one also needs to discuss these issues as well as compliance such as smoking, ongoing weight bearing, lack of glycemic control which may even prompt discontinuation of HBO. To limit the number of treatments we found it useful in practice to provide an interruption in HBO treatments as mentioned during the previous example. Often it's possible to pause around 15 treatments in the case of diabetic wounds to see whether the wound will continue to heal spontaneously. If the wound does continue to improve, it shows the patient is host competent and further HBO is not required. 
transcutaneous oximetry might be used to determine whether the actual values have improved, and this could perhaps hasten the decision without the need for a particular delay. If the wound fails to heal or shows signs of deterioration, HBO is justifiably reintroduced. The beauty of this approach is that it shows that you are cost conscious and it validates the role of the therapy. It's vital to realize that stopping HBO does not mean stopping patient care. Unfortunately, stopping HBO sometimes can lead patients to believe that they no longer need the wound care and aggressive attention they've received previously. And it's essential that it should be emphasized that patients should continue with rigorous follow-up. In fact, even more so when the HBO no longer provides the additional level of protection. The guidelines for reintroducing hyperbaric oxygen should also be stated clearly to all parties. A good example of this is the fact that HBO should be introduced immediately after surgical management of an irradiated wound. What knowledge and experience do you have in managing a particular condition? When accepting a patient for hyperbaric oxygen therapy, it's really important to consider the amount of experience one has had in treating this condition. This will frequently determine the ultimate outcome because it will ensure the timely inclusion of adjunctive services such as orthotics and offloading, antibiotics and so on. It will also prompt appropriate surgical management and will offer guidance on the overall management of the patient. It will pick up on early warning signs when things are going off the rails. At the very least, one should contemplate what is to be done, how it is to be done, who might assist in getting it done, and what resources are available. Only then can a patient be managed confidently and effectively. This is one of my patients that was referred with gas gangrene and a mixed bacterial infection. HBO was started promptly, but culture of a particular unusual clostridium prompted us by experience to ask whether this patient had been examined for an occult intestinal malignancy. It was found, the patient treated and not only did he recover from the gas gangrene, but survived the intestinal malignancy also. Does it make sense? It's always important to consider whether the treatment may actually be worse than the disease. The time and cost implications of undergoing HBO are significant. For elderly patients, possibly with a limited life expectancy, and no prospect of significant functional improvement or greater quality of life, there may be greater benefit in providing simple palliative wound care with more time to spend with their families rather than sitting around in hospitals. Even though HBO may be medically indicated, it may not be morally indicated in these cases. These decisions are hard to make and therefore extremely unpopular. Yet, I personally feel it is the height of medical judgment to be able to discuss these issues with patients and their families rather than to venture blindly just because HBO fits the disease process. While personal hardship and socio-economic difficulties should never preclude patients from receiving appropriate medical care, the cost-benefit of treatments should be considered with an understanding of all these issues. This is a patient who was referred to us with methicillin-resistant Staph aureus infection uh, surrounding a prosthesis in the hip. This was the patient's second hip replacement, and the question was whether hyperbaric oxygen would be helpful. Now, in general, hardware needs to come out whenever there is an infection and even HBO would not be able to eradicate it. In this case, however, we discovered that the infection had remained superficial, that there was no evidence of an extension of the infection to the prosthesis itself, and in a process of irrigation with antibiotics, judicious use of hyperbaric oxygen, and some surgical debridement, the patient was able to retain a very, very costly prosthesis. Had the infection spread and included the prosthesis, HBO would not have made sense. The last and perhaps the least popular consideration is whether or not the hyperbaric oxygen would be reimbursed. It is unpopular to be sure, but it is an essential part of the viability of hyperbaric medicine. Financial support and medical insurance impact on the quality of other treatment modalities available to the patient also. And therefore, if there is insufficient funding, merely providing the HBO in lieu of other treatment may be equally irresponsible. Perhaps one of the most extreme examples occurred in Russia in the 1970s. Medication, including antibiotics, was not always available, so HBO was used instead. 
Up to 70 treatments and more were provided. This resulted in extremely high treatment numbers and obviously a number of treatment failures. I'm not going to dwell on the issues of reimbursement here, but usually if there is medical insurance, the stronger the justification for the treatment, the better the chances are for being reimbursed. To review, the 10 things to consider when selecting patients for HBO are the pathophysiology, the conventional therapy, the odds and risks, the indication, the therapeutic mechanism, when to start, when to stop, the knowledge and experience you have in treating the condition, whether it makes sense, and whether you'll be reimbursed. Now, when evaluating patients, the following 10 things need to be considered. A need for further testing, the general health and nutritional assessment, wound assessment, the risk assessment, which includes the following seven items, barotrauma, oxygen toxicity, hypoglycemia, visual changes, anxieties and phobias, medication, and cardiorespiratory status. Let's switch now to the specific evaluations that may be required to ensure benefit and minimize risk in the application of HBO. Following the basic history and physical assessment of a patient, the following may be considered. Further testing. This may include assessment to confirm the benefits such as transcutaneous oximetry, MRI or MRA, bone scans and x-rays, as well as wound assessment. It may also include tests to exclude or mitigate patient risks, such as ECG, cardiac ultrasound, chest x-rays, lung function assessment, tympanometry and audiometry. General health and nutritional assessment. In addition to obvious problems such as diabetes and obesity, it is important to realize that nutritional deficiencies are very common in the elderly population and certainly in lower socioeconomic groups. Therefore, it's important to consider a patient's baseline nutritional state in order to allow supplementation if required. With the exception of screening and managing anemia and other major illnesses, empirical multivitamin supplementation is usually quite cost-effective and elaborate testing for various vitamin deficiencies is usually unnecessary. Until about 10 years ago, it was our regular practice to supplement large amounts of vitamin A, C and E, with scientific evidence now mounting in favor of the need for oxidative stress to signal wound healing, we have actually resumed a simple multivitamin approach rather than the former high doses of antioxidants. Wound care assessment. In our experience, approximately 70% of patients referred for hyperbaric oxygen have some chronic wound, and therefore Wound care assessment and documentation form a critical part of the patient assessment. They contribute significantly to the selection of patients for HBO and the ultimate success of the HBO treatment. Risk assessment. HBO therapy is not without risk. Therefore, the evaluation of patients must include specific attention to potential risk factors. Usually, these fall into one of the following seven categories. Barotrauma risk oxygen toxicity risk, hypoglycemia risk, visual changes, anxiety and phobias, medication, and cardiorespiratory status. Barotrauma. Barotrauma may affect the ears, sinuses, teeth, lungs, gastrointestinal tract, and of course all pathological air spaces. In practice, confirming ear equalizing and excluding pneumothoraces are the most important evaluations. Ear barotrauma is certainly the most common side effect of HBO, and it's also a common cause of treatment refusal. An undiagnosed or untreated pneumothorax, on the other hand, represents one of the few life-threatening problems, and is an absolute contraindication to HBO until it's treated. Pulmonary problems may be identified on history, or suspected due to the clinical findings associated with pulmonary barotrauma. Recent central line placements and stenotomy and thoracotomy or IC drains all are associated with potential pneumothoraces. An unsuccessful central line placement, for instance in an emergency setting, is a notorious precipitant of a small pulmonary pneumothorax that subsequently may result in a tension pneumothorax. It is very important to consider this, particularly if the patient has been uh, referred from an emergency room uh, without further extensive examination, for instance, in an ICU or prior to surgery.
sinus and tooth problems are usually discovered coincidentally as a result of discomfort during hyperbaric treatment and may then be managed reactively. Oxygen toxicity is relatively rare in hyperbaric practice, but there are certain risk factors that may increase this risk, and these should be examined and determined and possibly even managed in advance. They are pyrexia, hypoglycemia, the concurrent use of normobaric oxygen therapy between HBO treatments, general seizure tendencies, and the use of certain medications such as promethazine. Depending on the outcome of the evaluation and the indication for HBO, these factors are usually managed using lower therapeutic pressures, introducing air brakes or additional air brakes, and sometimes prescribing prophylactic anticonvulsants. Hypoglycemia risk. Diabetic problem wounds represent one of the most common indications for HBO. HBO affects glycemic control and thereby increases the risk of potential hypoglycemia, particular in patients requiring insulin. In addition to the dangers related to hypoglycemia as such, it is also a risk factor for oxygen-related seizures. There are various guidelines to minimize this risk once it is recognized. But importantly, it should be recognized and therefore blood glucose levels should be assessed prior to and following all hyperbaric treatments in diabetic patients, particularly those on insulin. Visual changes. Progressive myopia is a known consequence of hyperbaric treatment. It usually becomes apparent in patients older than 40 years after about 15 hyperbaric treatments. Now the condition is largely reversible, but it still has significant implications. For instance, on the patient's ability to drive safely or legally, particularly at night. It affects their balance and even their general quality of life. It may affect the ability to read or watch television and enjoy their hobbies. In addition, there's the theoretical risk that an existing cataract may mature more quickly. Patients who have received high doses of cortisone previously for medical conditions, those who have received head and neck irradiation or suffer from diabetes are all at an increased risk for ocular complications. Evaluation by an ophthalmologist may therefore be indicated and patients may need to receive counselling about replacing corrective lenses after hyperbaric treatment. Also, usually we recommend that they wait at least six weeks after concluding HBO before doing so to avoid multiple prescriptions. Psychological issues. Assessment of anxiety and claustrophobia forms a vital part of evaluating patients for HBO. The reason for this is that anxious patients may abort treatments and refuse further care. We recommend a high index of suspicion and a low threshold for prescribing anti-anxiety medication as long as the patients aren't driving themselves. If patients tell you they are anxious, believe them. Medication considerations. Medication may have significant impact on HBO therapy. There are a range of decongestants that may interfere with circulation. Anti-cancer agents may even precipitate pulmonary fibrosis or cardiac toxicity. Accordingly, this is an important part of the assessment and one needs to be familiar with the drug-drug interactions with HBO and to look for them. Lastly, cardiorespiratory status. Patients with cardiorespiratory compromise may be at risk of decompensating during HBO. It is known that left ventricular failure may progress into pulmonary edema as a result of HBO. The mechanism is not entirely understood, but patients with left ventricular ejection fractions below 30% are certainly potentially at risk. Patients with orthopnea may also not be treatable in small monoplace facilities. This concludes the overview of the selection and evaluation of patients for hyperbarics. In summary, the 10 things to consider when evaluating patients are a need for further assessment or testing, the general health and nutritional assessment, wound assessment, and risk assessment, which includes the following seven items. Barotrauma, oxygen toxicity, hypoglycemia, visual changes, anxieties and phobias, medication, and cardiorespiratory status. It is my hope that, armed with this general approach, you may be able, even as a relatively inexperienced hyperbaric physician or someone who trains people in hyperbaric medicine, to assist in improving appropriate selection and evaluation of patients for HBO, whilst at the same time avoiding the risks and difficulties associated with providing right treatments, but for the wrong reason or at the wrong time. Thank you.